Welcome to Vineyard Boise. It's our vision to make the invisible God visible wherever He places us. We come together on Sundays to worship and fellowship corporately, but we know that church isn't just about Sunday. It's about a lifelong day-to-day following of Christ with other believers. We invite you to join us just as you are. If you'd like to support our ministry, visit vineyardboise.org and click the Give Online button. Well, right now we're in a series in the book of Judges. It's, we're, we're calling this particular series Identity. Um, and here's the reality of the book of Judges. Judges uh, is, is a book that begins on seemingly a high note. Uh, it, it, it picks up where Joshua, the book of Joshua, left off. Uh, Joshua ends with the, the people of Israel in the promised land at last. And it's something that's been, that Scripture has been moving towards, the story, the narrative of Scripture has been moving towards for, for you know, hundreds of years. And, and, and at last, at the end of Joshua, Israel is in the promised land, and it seems like a brand new day, and, you know, the, a new day on the horizon. And then in the book of Judges, we see an eclipse gradually coming across the, the nation of Israel. Our, our Vine Arts team has depicted this, even with this backdrop, that you see this, this bright day that's gradually being eclipsed. And as we move through this series, we realize that this eclipse is growing more and more powerful, more and more pervasive. And so what we see is we, we end the book of Judges, and we'll get there in a few weeks, but we end with, with Israel um, on this downward spiral where they're literally circling the drain, as it were. And... As we're in this series, we're, we're, we're having it as an opportunity to talk about identity because, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of ways we could look at this text. There's a lot of, you know, kind of filters we could use to, to look at the book of Judges. We're looking at it to find what does it tell us about our identity as the people of God because our calling is not really about what happens in here. Okay, we're, the, we're a church, but the church is not the building. The church, this, this building is just our campus, it's where we meet. Sometimes we call it a sanctuary in here. Sometimes we call it a, a training room. Sometimes we call it a locker room. But the point is that we come here and there's, there's a reason. We come together to get, um, to get bandaged up sometimes. Uh, we come to have an encounter with God. Sometimes that's a first encounter. Uh, but then there's the, the ongoing encounters. We encounter God in worship. It's like, a, it's like a spiritual reset button every week, you know, to find ourselves again in the reality of who God is and his presence, his goodness, his power. And we need that hope in a world that's often dark. And so we, we do that and we come together, but the reality is that, that our life, it's not just about what happens here, it's about what we do when we leave here. Because we're called to be God's presence within this world. We're called to be a people that where through, in our lives that heaven is touching earth through our lives. And so as we go out from here into the places where we live and where we work, our families, our friendships, our, our work environments, we're to be literally the presence of God's love in the absences of the world. But it's to the degree that we understand who we are, we understand our identity, that we can do that. And we're not just talking about our natural identity. In fact, we're, we're actually not talking about our natural identity, not our natural birth. What we're talking about is a new identity. What, what's called in Scripture, sometimes it's called a new creation. Uh, Jesus calls it being born again of the Spirit. Everybody's born once. If you're born in this world, you're born once. You're born of the flesh. Some people get born twice. It's a spiritual rebirth. And the reality of Scripture that the, the, the we're told to anchor into is that if we live out of that new identity, if that becomes more pervasive, more foundational for us, than our, our earthly identity, our birth identity, then we will be a blessing. We will then be able to be the presence of God's love in the absence of the world. So that's why we're, we're, we're working through this series and really asking God to help us understand who we're called to be. Um, last week we looked at identity found. This week we're talking about identity grasped. And, um, you know, we could have called it identity seized or identity taken hold of, identity embraced, identity realized. There's a number of ways we could communicate that, but it's all the idea that we're rooting into a different, a different reality that's not just about who we are as individuals or as American citizens, but as the people of God. Oftentimes when, when I, you know, welcome our, you on our Sunday mornings, I say, good morning, saints. Um, 
that's actually trying to root into our new identity. That's the way Paul did it in the New Testament. When he was writing to the early churches, he didn't call them by their, by their national identity. He didn't, he didn't call them the, to the, just the Corinthians or just the Ephesians. He called them the saints in Ephesus, the saints in Corinth. He was calling them to, to realize that they have a new identity in Christ, and that was more foundational than just their, their national identity. So as we get into this, there's, this, this morning, I, our thesis is this. Identity grasped, we are a people who have had a personal transforming encounter with God. Because of that, we live rooted in and accountable to his presence, his calling, his character. Let me read that again. The, the one that's the first one there on your screen, found, that was the one we looked at last week. If you weren't here, you can catch that online. Identity grasped, we are a people who have had a personal transforming encounter with God and we live rooted in and therefore accountable to his presence, his calling, his character. Now, that's to the degree that you're a Christian. And uh, if you have not had a personal encounter, just like I was talking about this morning, about, you know, we have, we have kids that grew up in the church who, are, uh, who, who, who know a lot about God. They're very familiar with um, maybe the teachings of Scripture, but they haven't always had a personal encounter with God. And it's when that personal encounter happens, that's what changes everything. Today we're going to see this identity, this idea of being rooted in God's character and his calling and, and accountable to that. We're going to see that fleshed out in the life of, of a character in our sto story. We're going to see it both positive and negatively. We're going to see the potential of what happens when we, when we live out of that calling and also the danger, the destruction that happens when we drift away from it. And it's possible, it's possible for us to be people who are rooted in God's identity and then for us to drift away and create all kinds of havoc around us in the lives of the people that are our family, our friends, our coworkers. And so the question is, how do we root in God's character so that we are more of a blessing and less destructive? That's kind of where we're going today. So um, let me remind you of the cycle that we have in the book of Judges. This is now the fourth turn through this cycle that we're going to see today, this, this story that we're in. We're going to be in the story of Gideon. It's, it's Judges 6 through 8. And um, the cycle that's depicted over and over that kind of creates the structure for the book of Judges is a cycle that begins with the people of Israel. Uh, sometimes it's within one tribe, sometimes it's with the people as a whole, but they sin against God and they forget who is their good, loving, heavenly father. They declare independence and do their own thing. They choose other gods. They choose the gods of the, of the uh, nations that they've inhabited. And then this lands them in oppression. Typically, it's a, it's a foreign nation coming in and oppressing them, subjecting them to uh, cruel oppression. Uh, at some point, they repent. They call out to God. They say, we know we're in this situation because we abandoned you and we created this. Would you restore us? And at the point that they repent, God raises up a deliverer. In the book of Judges, they're called, they're called a judge. And that's not a judge in like the judicial or the legal sense. It's more of a military commander. So God raises up a judge to deliver them. And then um, once they have deliverance from that enemy, they experience a season of peace. And then after that, peace is, that season of peace is over, or after that judge dies, they forget and they sin again and the cycle starts all over. And as I said earlier, it all ends with Israel on this downward spiral and, and really circling the drain. Um, let me give you a little visual for, for what's happening. And here's the reason that this book exists is that God is revealing to Israel the nature of their wound. They have a, they have a, a wound that was self-inflicted. If you go all the way back to the beginning of creation, back to our first parents, when our first parents rebelled against our creator and declared independence, mankind sustained a wound. And, but the question is, what's the nature of that wound? Um, this, back in November, I had a, a sore mysteriously open up on my leg. Like, there was no trauma. I hadn't had a, an accident, but I had this sore open up on my leg. And um, no big deal. I thought it would go away by itself. And when it didn't, after a few days, I, I decided, well, I should do something about it. So I, you know, I cleaned it and put on some hydrocortisone and a Band-Aid. And eventually it started to heal. But then while it was healing, another one opened up lower down on my leg. So then I started treating that one. And while that one was healing, another one opened up on my other leg, and then they started opening up on my arms. And pretty soon I realized, um, one, this isn't going to go away by itself, and two, I don't know how to deal with this. 
The things that I thought would, would take care of this are not working. I actually need help. I need a doctor. And so I went to my doctor, and he diagnosed me with, uh, really, he said, that what you have is not, it's not something you can treat topically because it's actually systemic. It's in, it's in your bloodstream at this point. You have an infection. You have, actually, I had a staph infection. It was a, a strain of MRSA. And he said, left untreated, this could actually be very serious, maybe even lethal, but if you'll follow my instructions, I can take care of this for you. I said, well, I'd like to do that, I think. <laughs> right? So I did. He put me on a very specific, very, uh, very strong antibiotic, and uh, eventually I was, I was taken care of. But the point of this is this. Israel has a wound, and they don't really know the nature of their wound. First of all, the cycle tells us the wound's not going to go away by itself. It keeps repeating. You can deal with it in one place, but it pops up somewhere else. And as soon as, that, as, soon as the Band-Aid's gone, it pops up again in a new place. And, uh, and so it's not going to be healed. This wound is not going to be healed by just better leadership. It's not going to be healed by religion. It's not going to be healed by technology. It's not going to be healed by laws. It's not... Like, there's a problem, and what it's driving them to the point is to realize what we need is a savior. We actually can't deal with this ourselves. We need somebody to save us from ourselves. Now, that's not just Israel's condition. That really happened. This, this cycle that we're seeing, it's not a metaphor. This truly happened. We're going to read about geography today in the story that you can find. You could go over to modern-day Palestine, and you could find the caves and the plain that's, that's in this story. So this really happened, but it's also teaching us the, the bigger picture of the human condition. That going back to the garden, there is a wound that every single one of us carry. We're all image bearers of God, but unfortunately, we're also image bearers of Adam. And that sinful nature has been passed along. And we have a wound that can only be dealt with by a doctor, by a surgeon. And, and we've all tried lots of Band-Aids. And if you think about your own life, you can probably find yourself in that cycle where you know, you, you've got a problem in your life and you, you do something about it and you, maybe you've even asked God for help and he helps you, but then you turn back to it and you find yourself in the cycle over and over. And the point is that at some point we get to say, God, uh, I, don't just need, you know, I don't just need a helper, I need a savior. And when people reach that place, that's, that's the encounter. That's the encounter that, that changes everything. So today we're going to be read about that in the book of uh, Judges. We're going to encounter this in the, in the life of a man named Gideon. We're going to pick up in 6.1. Here's the beginning of this fourth cycle. The people of Israel did what was evil uh, in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. Because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. Here's why. Here's why they're hiding in caves. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza. And they would leave no sustenance in Israel, no sheep, no ox, no donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come like locusts in number, both they and their camels. They could not be counted so that they laid waste to the land as they came in. Okay, this is the setup. And the oppression that Israel experiences in this cycle, it's different than the last cycle. And the one we looked at last week uh, said that Sisera cruelly oppressed them for 20 years. Uh, and, and the language there is of, of, of violence. It was, a, it was an oppressive violence. This seems less violent. It's more of a, oh, gosh, it's just, it's, it's wearisome. Uh, what they're doing is they're coming in, and, and the very land that Israel secured in last week's victory over Sisera and over Barak, or through Barak and, and Deborah and Jael, the very land they secured, they're now trying to, uh, to, to raise crops there, and they're using it for agriculture. But every time they raise a crop, the Amalekites and the Midianites sweep in like locusts and just devour everything. And so they're left to sustain themselves on just, instead of, you know, 90% of a harvest on 10%. I liken it to the... Um, you, you remember a few years ago, there was this big kind of, uh, I don't know, it was a trend that happened. It was, you saw it on Facebook a lot and other places like that. There was this trend called flash mobs. 
And a lot of times, like around Christmas, you'd have people that would uh, position themselves like in a public place, and then they, one person would stand up and start singing, and then somebody else would stand up and start singing, and pretty soon they're all singing the Hallelujah Chorus, and everybody's going, well, what is this, right? So it was a flash mob. And um, it was arranged by social media, and so everybody would say, okay, let's all meet in this place, and we'll all sing, and then we'll just evaporate, and people will be left wondering what happened. Well, there was a, a, a group of people, brilliant but deviously criminal people, <laughs> who, uh, and this is happening over on the East Coast, said, boy, that has so much potential. We should do a flash rob. <laughs> and they would arrange by social media to have everyone descend on a specific business at a very specific time, and everyone would just go into that business in mass, rob it blind, and then just leave. And because there were so many people that just rushed in, I mean, imagine a convenience store where everybody just rushed in, grabbed everything off the shelves, a whole mob of people, and then just ran out the door. And you've got the guy going, uh, what do I do, you know? This is what's happening in Israel. It's a seven-year flash rob. And every time they start to have a harvest, the Amalekites and the Midianites rush in. So after seven years of this, the people get weary. Now, it strikes me odd that it took seven years but honestly, again, if this book is actually showing us a little, you know, a little snapshot of the human condition, isn't that the human condition? That oftentimes we experience the consequences of, of our own choices, but it takes a while for it to reach a stage that's intolerable. That we know we need to change, but the idea of changing, we don't want to give up the things that we're doing. At this point, the people, they're saying, you know what? We know the answer is to turn back to God, but we're not prepared to do that just yet. And so for seven years, they live like this. You know what? We don't have to keep living like this. It comes to a place of saying, God, I recognize that, that the consequences of what I'm choosing are honestly worse than what it would look like to be obedient. And the blessings of obedience are stronger than the consequences of sin. To turn to him. Verse 6, Israel was brought very low because of Midian. The people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and I brought you up out of the house of slavery. I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you. I drove them out before you and I gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites whose land you, in whose land you dwell. But you, but you have not obeyed my voice. Now this is important because their circumstances are self-inflicted. But we're going to see as we get into the text and, and we, we get to encounter one of one through a dialogue that they're actually blaming God for their circumstances. And again, this is part of the human condition is that we don't want to take ownership a lot of times for the stuff we've created. And the reality is because we live in a fallen world, not every negative thing that we experience is self-inflicted. There's a lot of times where we simply experience the residue of living in a, a fallen, broken creation. But our unwillingness to ask the question, are my circumstances connected to my disobedience? Or... Have I put these things in motion? Is the, the, the things that I'm experiencing that I hate, did I actually do something to put these in motion? At this point, Israel's not asking that question. They're blaming God. And so God has to start and he has to say, okay, just understand, the only way out of the cycle you're in is for you to realize that you're the one doing it to yourself. That I'm not to blame. Because as long as you're a victim, you, you can't do anything about it. At the point that you acknowledge, I keep creating this, now you're in a place to ask for a savior. And so, so God comes to them and he says, you did this. The human condition is in, that until we ask, why are we, or maybe more personally, why am I? Why am I incapable of consistently obeying? Why am I incapable of choosing the right thing, the loving thing, maybe the selfless thing? Why can't I do that consistently? And we come to the point of recognizing that, that's when we get in touch with the nature of our heart. That we actually, we don't need a band-aid. We don't need just a program. We don't need a book. We don't need a new leader. We don't need a new, we need a savior. In God's mercy, 
He points that out to them because he wants them to get out of the cycle. But then he doesn't deal with them according to their faithlessness. He deals with them according to his faithfulness. Read what happens. Verse 11, Now the angel of the Lord came and he sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the, the Abiezrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. Okay? He was beating out wheat in a winepress to hide it from the Midianites. We get introduced to two characters that are going to be relevant in this story. One is the angel of the Lord. A little bit of theo- theological debate over who exactly that is. There's two options, both that we find in Scripture. The question is, which one do we have here? One option is that it, is, it really is a, an angelic visitor, uh, a messenger from God, um, sent from God to, to be his, um, his emissary, to, be, to communicate God's will and to basically be his representative uh, to a, a person. Okay? We see angelic messengers throughout Scripture. Um, there's also an option that it's actually the Lord himself, that God himself takes on flesh. And uh, we, theologically, this is called a Christophany. Uh, it's a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus on the earth. That, that when Jesus appears in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and is born in Bethlehem as a baby, that's, that's when he takes on human flesh. That's his beginning of his human life. But that's not the beginning of Jesus. In fact, John tells us that Jesus has been eternally existent as the second member of the Trinity. That he has no beginning and no end. And so that same being, Jesus, has, has appeared a few times throughout Scripture. And one of the indicators when you're reading through the Old Testament, you're trying to figure out, is this an angelic messenger or is this maybe God himself, Jesus taking on flesh even before the incarnation, is, is he worshipped? Angels, when people try to worship angels, angels always deflect and say, no, don't worship me, I'm just an angel, you worship God. And when you see one of these angels actually receive worship, or even command worship, it's a good indication that it might be a Christophany, okay? So we'll, we'll look at that in this passage. The second person we're introduced to is Gideon, and he's an Israelite. He's a Hebrew man. He's a, a member of the tribe of Manasseh. What we get to find out about him is that he's been shaped by the time in which he lives, by the culture in which he lives. And so this is important because we're talking about identity. Gideon's identity is that he is from the least tribe and the least family in the least tribe, and he is hiding right now from the Midianites. He's living in fear. This is a consistent theme in his life, is the theme of fear. And what is he doing? He's actually, he's harvesting the wheat. He's, um, he's, and the, you know, the idea here is you take the wheat and you, you blow on it and you separate it and try and get the, the wind to blow the chaff off so you can separate the wheat from the chaff. Well, in order to do that, you need to be in an open air environment. He's in a, what? He's in a wine press, okay? There's not much wind in a wine press. <laughs> so this isn't very effective, but, but he's hiding from the Midianites. He's living in fear, okay? This is his identity, his beliefs, and it's shaping his behavior. Verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, to the one hiding in the wine press, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Mighty man of valor. Now, we don't know exactly what happened there, but I, I tend to picture Gideon like him looking over his shoulder like, is somebody else here? I thought I was all by myself. Because he doesn't, he doesn't feel like a mighty man of valor. If he felt like a mighty man of valor, he wouldn't be hiding in the wine press, would he? And we're going to see fear is actually a characteristic in his life. It's part of his identity at this point. But God's calling him into a new identity. And what you have to notice, what we have to notice is it's attached to the promise of his presence. God says, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. There is never a time in Scripture where God calls somebody to live out their identity and it's not attached to the promise of him being with them. Because the identity, if we're going to live out of a new identity, it's not about us looking inward, it's about us looking upward. Judges 6.13, Gideon said to him, please, my Lord, here's where you hear him blaming. This is his worldview, his belief system. Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Do you hear the blame? Where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us? Saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. This is just a church kid. This is a a kid who grew up hearing all the stories but has not had a personal encounter with the living God yet. And so... When he does have one, he doesn't really know what kind of encounter he's having. His first response is, yeah, well, I've heard all the stories, but I'm not seeing it in my life. 
Gideon is stuck in his beliefs, the way that he thinks about God, about himself, and about his people. And that belief system that's shaped by the time and the culture he lives in has him blaming God, which leaves him what? It leaves him self-reliant and it leaves him stuck. He's living according to his natural resources, according to the circumstance. The circumstances merit that he's hiding in a wine press. That's what everybody else is doing too. Makes sense. But there's more for him. Verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you. Now do you see he's calling him to a new identity. He's calling him to be a mighty man. He's calling him to do something out of that identity, to act differently, to go save Israel. But again, he attaches it to the promise of his presence. Do not I send you. Verse 15, and he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I am the least in my father's house. He's, he's stuck in his own identity, his natural birth. And he says, these, these circumstances tell me that I can't do this. Now, he's not the first leader to do this, not the only leader to do this. If we were to keep reading in Scripture, you'll find all kinds of leaders who God comes and says, I have a calling on your life, and I want you to live out of that calling, and I want you to be a blessing to the people around you. And oftentimes people say, well, who am I? And if we get into the book of Samuel, if we keep reading this narrative, we'll end up in Samuel. Saul, Saul the first king of Israel, he'll ask that question. He'll say, in fact, it'll be very similar. He'll say, my, tribe is the, my family is the least in the tribe of Benjamin. We'll get to King David, next generation. David will say, who am I? We'll get to his son Solomon, and Solomon will say, who am I? This is the wrestling between our natural identity and embracing a God-given identity. And there's a struggle for it. There's a process. There's a gap. And what happens is there can be a preoccupation with self. And if we stay there, it will always lead to one of two extremes. And it'll manifest differently. It's going to look different. But it'll either be inadequacy or pride. Okay, these are, this is the pendulum. It can swing either way. The middle is living in our identity. Who God's called us to be. But if we drift from that, we can drift into insecurity where we say, I can't do anything. How, how could God do anything with me? Or we drift into pride saying, I got this. Do you have any idea who I am? And, and we can actually drift really quickly from one to the other. The question is, is there, is there a way to stay rooted? What's, look what happens. God's going to give him a way that he can stay rooted in a God-given identity and therefore the, the behavior that, that emits out of that by giving him a sign. The Lord said, verse 16, the Lord said to him, but I will be with you. He said, uh, hey, how can I save Israel? I'm from the least tribe. And God doesn't even argue with him. He doesn't say, oh, no, really, your tribe's actually pretty awesome. And, and you're well-educated, Gideon. And I think you got this. You just, you just haven't given yourself a chance. He doesn't talk him up with a bunch of self-talk. He, he just basically says, yeah, that might be true. Everything you just said about yourself, it's probably true. But here's the difference. I am with you. And if you put your hope in that, that's going to change everything. But I will be with you. And you shall strike the Midianites as if they're one man. Again, Gideon, the hope for you living differently, for living out of your identity, for, for following that identity into a calling, it's not by looking inward and finding it inside. It's by looking upward, and putting an anchor in him. Gideon said, verse 17, if I have now found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from me from here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. He said, I will stay until you return. So Gideon went into the house. He prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour. Unleavened cake sounds delicious. Uh, <laughs> I've actually done that when I was a baker. It's not good. Um, cracker cake. The meat he put in a basket, and the broth he put in a pot, and he brought them to him under the terebinth and presented him. Now that's a pretty extravagant meal in lean times like this. The angel of the Lord said to him, take the meat and the unleavened cakes, put them on this rock, pour the broth over them. Okay? Saturate this food in the broth. And he did so. And the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of his staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes, and fire sprang up from the rock and consume the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. So that's different, right? <laughs> Fire from a rock, consuming a wet meal, soggy cracker. But here's the importance, and here's why, here's why there's a sign where theologians would say, this is probably a Christophany. This is more than the angel of the Lord. 
because he turns a meal into a sacrifice. This, this becomes a moment of worship. This becomes holy ground. And the importance for that is he's sending Gideon. So he's not going to be with Gideon in the flesh like side by side. Gideon's not going to walk hand in hand with this Christophany to go fight the Midianites. He's going to have to go in the promised presence, trusting that the invisible God is with him. And, but he gives him a sign to anchor into. He says, I want you to remember this. You have had an encounter with the living God. Verse 22. And then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. This is the most common command in Scripture. Don't be afraid. There's a reason for that. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord, and he called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it still stands at Ophrah, which belongs to the Abiezrites. That night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull, and the second bull, seven years old, pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that's beside it. These are, these are implements for worshiping the gods of the Amorites. These are, this is an altar to, a, to an idol. Build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. Take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you cut down. So Gideon took 10 men of his servants and did, he obeyed, as the Lord told him, but because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. Okay? That's the end of our story as far as what we're going to read today. There's two more chapters. It's actually a very long story. It's Judges 6 through 8 if you want to read it. I would encourage you to. Uh, we're just going to hit a few highlights here. But two important things we learned from that last passage. Gideon's father operated, he maintained, maybe even built an altar to one of the false gods. So in the, the family that Gideon's grown up in, although he's heard the stories of God, there's been some stuff mixed in that's been pretty false. And so part of him having an encounter with God and learning to live differently and lead differently is, is sorting out what parts of my culture that I've been shaped by are actually godly and what parts are actually false. And, and God takes them on a process. That's, that's all of us. We have to recognize that we are shaped by our culture, by our family of origin, and some of that's good and some of it's probably not. And if we're humble, God can teach us. Secondly, we find that Gideon is obeying, but he's still a man in process because he's wrestling with fear. So here's a few highlights from the rest of the story. And I'm going to put highlights in quotes because some of them are highlights and some of them are maybe low lights. They're, um, they're the big points in the story, the big movements, but some of them are, it's conflicted at best. So here's what happens. God confirms Gideon's calling and the promise of his empowering presence with three more signs. Um, because Gideon has a, a big quest in front of him, because he's uh, struggling with fear, God meets him there and actually gives him three different signs. In addition to the, the meal that becomes a sacrifice, he gives him two signs, one, two that involve um, God's ability to override the natural order. It's the, the putting out a fleece and seeing whether it's wet or dry in the morning, and it's, he switches it twice. It's, it's the language that in church world we get I'm, I'm going to put a fleece before God. People pray about that sometimes. It comes out of this passage. But the point of it for, for Gideon is to recognize that, that God can invert the natural order. He's not limited to the way things normally play out. That's going to be really important when he sees the size of his army versus the size of the Midianite army. Secondly, uh, or the last sign, the fourth one, is when he hears two Midianite soldiers. He, he goes down to their camp and he overhears them talking. And he overhears their, them having a dream and processing their dream. And one of them goes, you know what this dream means? It means that God has given us into the hands of, of Gideon, which he's not even known to them. So that's a miracle. And he goes back and says, okay, I think God's got this. <laughs> right? So he's got his four signs. So rooted in God's promised presence and his own calling, rooting in those four signs, Gideon obeys and he calls Israel to war. What happens? Well, 32,000 Israelites respond to ward off the 135,000 Midianites who've gathered in the valley, okay? Gideon's likely counting noses. He, he, his army comes together. He's counting the Midianites down in the valley. And he's like, well, 32,000 to 30, 135, that's like four to one. He's like, that's not very good odds. He's probably praying. He's like, God, are you seeing this? These odds are not looking very good. And God's like, you know what? You are right. Those are not good odds. <laughs> you have far too many people. If you win just with four to one odds, Israel's going to think you did this by your own strength. 
And I want Israel to know that you've had a savior, that I have intervened. And so he says, let's send some of these guys home. And then Gideon and God have this series of filters where they basically winnow the army from 32,000 down to 300. So now the odds are, what, 135,000 versus 300. Just if you don't have your calculators with you, that's 450 to 1. 450 Amalekite Midianite soldiers to one Israelite soldier. And God says, oh, that's much better. So you read the story, it's a, it's a fantastic story, you should read it. God secures Israel's victory through the remaining 300 without them ever even lifting a sword. That's when it's, that's, that's, that's Gideon living as, you know, dialed into God's presence and God's calling. And he's able to lead these 300 men and, and they secure victory for Israel. But then the pendulum swings, not this time into insecurity, but into pride. Listen to what happens. As Gideon and his men chase down the remnants, he asks for supplies from two Israelite towns. They're, they're chasing down they're just the, the remnants of the Midianite army trying to, to finish them off. And uh, he goes into two towns and says, hey, we've been, we're on campaign, we're hungry, could you feed us? And the two towns say, um, we don't see you already having secured the victory. In these meager times, why would we share our bread with you? And he takes personal offense at that. So Gideon returns to slaughter the men in those two towns and, who refuse to help. He slaughters for a personal offense for the guys who say, we don't see you already having the victory. He comes back and he kills men in both towns and he breaks their town up. He busts the town up. They have a tower in the town that's their, it's their security building where they, you know, they can look out and they can see who's coming. And he destroys it. This is pride. This is him going, do you have any idea who I am? This is, this is the danger when we drift out of an identity that's God's calling. We can be incredibly destructive. God has been faithful to rescue the people, not because they've been faithful, but because he is faithful. But Gideon makes it about Gideon. And because of that, his influence becomes a curse instead of a blessing. Lastly, two things. Gideon spo- uses the spoils from the, the victory to fashion a golden ephod for the people that leads them back into idol worship. Uh, ephod was a, a priestly garment. He takes all the gold. He takes over 40 pounds of gold, fashions this thing. And just like his dad had had an uh, uh, altar to Baal where all the community gathered to worship, he provides this thing. And we don't ex- understand exactly what happened, but the language is really dark. It says that Israel whored after the ephod. Instead of, instead of having a pure devotion to the living God, they hoard after the ephod. Lastly, Gideon uses his influence for personal pleasure, taking on many wives, yielding 70 sons, probably some daughters mixed in there as well, um, and at least one concubine, which that becomes relevant for next week's passage. So um, he's acting like the neighboring kings. He's establishing his security through a large family. He's using his influence to, 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 to have personal pleasure sometimes acting in ways that are admirable, sometimes courageous. At other times, Gideon operates out of fear and petty vengeance. His story is a conflicted one. Sometimes he points people to God. Other times he leads people away from God. Sometimes he serves the people. Sometimes he takes from them. The application for us is, is there a way that we can live if we've had that personal encounter with God and we have a a new identity and because of that, a calling, and there's behavior that should emit out of that, is there a way for us to stay more grounded in that calling so that we're not drifting into pride where we're taking from people or insecurity where we're failing to step into opportunities? Is there a way that we can stay more anchored? And the, the, the life of David would tell us yes. If we keep reading the book of, and just keep, keep reading through the story of Scripture, we come to the, the life of David, a little over 20 years ago, uh, when I was teaching Bible in Southeast Asia, the, one of the first Old Testament books I taught through was First and Second Samuel. And so they were stories I was familiar with in terms of like individual stories, but I was reading them all together. And I had a chance to compare and contrast the lives of Saul and David. And I realized that Saul was the first king of Israel, David was the second king, and they both had very similar times, similar circumstances, similar birth situations. Not, neither of them came from noble families. Um, both of them had the same calling to be the, the king of Israel. And both of them were actually empowered by the Spirit of God. And don't miss this. Saul, who failed miserably, who ends his monarchy and ends his life, ends his reign, slain on Mount Gilboa with his family, the, the bodies of his family, carcasses all around him. 
he was empowered by the Spirit of God for the mission he was called to. The failure was not that he wasn't empowered, it's that he didn't, he didn't live anchored into it. He drifted into insecurity or pride, and Saul was always swinging back and forth. And so if you could, if you could emulate, like, what is the, the, the image that symbolizes Saul's leadership? It was a spear. And any time he felt insecure or threatened, he'd throw that spear at somebody. But David was able to stay anchored in who God had called him to be. And so the, the image that represents David's reign, it's not a spear, it's not a scepter, it's not one of power, it's of a towel. He served his, his, his authority was a stewardship for the sake of the people of Israel. And I was studying this passage and I came to this verse that I realized this is the key verse of David's life. It comes in 2 Samuel 5.12. David then perceived, this is after he becomes king, David then perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel. He hadn't put himself in this place. He didn't do it by his own hand. It's not because he took Saul's life. He waited for God to do it. And that God had established his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel. That his leadership was not about him personally finding validation. It's not about his self-actualization. It's not about him surrounding himself with a lot of wives. It's not about his comfort. It's about him using that influence to be a blessing to other people. And I realize there's an opportunity for all of us here to, to look at the same thing and to say, God, would you help me to see my life through that lens? To find my identity in who you're called me to be. And would you establish me as a blessing to the people around me? We're going to close this morning with a quick workshop. Here's what I want to ask you to do. First of all, if you've never had a personal encounter with the living God, there's a, there's a beginning to that, and it's just a moment of repentance. It's, a, it's acknowledging, God, the wound of sin in my life is not one I can fix. I haven't been able to fix it. I can't do enough good things to fix the wound. I find myself in these cycles over and over. I need a Savior. I need someone who can forgive me and grant me new life. When you, when you come to that point, you can pray and, and God will meet you because it's not about your faithfulness, it's about his. He does it every time. So this morning, as we close, our, our pastors are gonna be available underneath the screens on both sides and we would love to pray with you. If you'd like, if you've never began that encounter and you'd like to ask God for that, we'd just like to come alongside you and pray with you for that. But I wanna put this, this verse up and give you a chance to personalize it. This is that same verse and I've just left it blank and you've got some some writing little writing notes there at your tables. They're in the boxes. It says sermon notes. I want you to consider one sphere of your life, one role in your life where you influence other people. Could be as a, uh, a father, a mother, a sibling, a child. Could be um, a friend or a coworker. And I want you to, to, to try and personalize this. And think about a place where you recognize my influence in this relationship has not been what it could be that God has more for me and more for the people in my life if I was to be anchored in who he's called me to be and live out of that. Okay, so for example, um, I personalize this. Through, for the last 20 years, I've been doing this every time I find myself in a new role. So when I came into this role, it was uh, Trevor then perceived that the Lord had established him as a pastor to Vineyard Boise and that he had established him here, there for the sake of his people, Vineyard Boise. That my leadership, it's not about me finding my identity in a role. That it's not about self-actualization. It's not about my ego. It's not about my pride. It's not about me being insecure that I, that I don't have it all together. And I can drift back and forth. I can drift into both of those extremes. But there's a calling to say, God, you placed me here. Would you establish me today as a blessing to the people that I would encounter? It keeps me in a place of servanthood. It gives me accountability. gives me calling. keeps me grounded. We have the capacity to do this with any relationship in your life. If you are a child of God, God has placed you in relationships to be a blessing. And so would you just take a moment to personalize this at your table? Just consider one role. You can, you can go back and do it for all the roles in your life, but consider one where God's calling you to be a greater blessing.
maybe you're a, a father or a mother. Um, I've personalized this just for my family relationships. Trevor then perceived that the Lord had established him as a father to Patience and Paige, and that he had established him there for the sake of his daughters, Patience and Paige. That gives me accountability. You know, sometimes we can parent out of pride, out of people wanting to, to, to think that we're excellent parents, and we're embarrassed when our kids don't do the things that we want them to do. That's not a healthy place to parent from. God, would you help me to parent for the sake of your children? Would you help me to make you visible to my daughters, Patience and Paige? Would you help me to reflect them, reflect you to them with, with fewer and fewer distortions? May my fatherhood not be a barrier to them experiencing you as a good father. Just thinking through this is all kinds of things you can pray through. As we close today, we're closing prayer, and if you want, you can stick around and you can share right at the table. Hey, this is, this is the one that God invited me to personalize. Um, I would encourage you to keep this. You can rewrite it somewhere. You can rewrite it on a three-by-five card. Somebody, someplace, stick it in your Bible. Maybe stick it on the mirror. But invite God to establish you as a blessing. As you go out from here, this, remember, it's not about here. It's about what we do out there. Invite God to establish you as a blessing. To, to anchor your heart and your actions in a calling to be a blessing to other people and know that he's going to empower you. In the same way that he empowered Gideon to, to defeat 135,000 Midianites with 300 people, God can empower you to be a blessing to your coworkers, to your neighbors, to your family, to your friends. But we've got to stay anchored in that and keep asking him, God, don't let me drift into pride. Don't let me drift into insecurity. Would you keep forming Christ in me? As we close in prayer, our, our, we've got pastors on the sides of the room. Our prayer team will be there as well. I want to invite you if this morning, if, if you have not begun a personal relationship with Jesus, if, if maybe you know about God, but there's no experience of God's nearness to you, we'd love to pray with you. We'd love to pray for uh, forgiveness, for repentance, for new life, for that new identity that God's called you to. And um, we'd like to come alongside you and pray with you for that. So you can go to them for that. Additionally, if you've got needs you came with this morning uh, that you would just like to, the prayer team to join you in, you can go, go there for prayer. We have soaking prayer on Monday nights out in the office lobby for additional prayer environments. Um, but let's close and just ask God to root us in this. God, we live in times where, uh, like Israel, there is... Uh, there's moments of brightness and then there's also the moments of the darkness. There's moments where we've, we sense that there's an eclipse coming. And you've called us to be those who are ambassadors of light, who, who are the very presence of your love in the absences of the world. And Lord, we have no capacity to do that on our own strength. We, we cannot heal ourselves. But we thank you that you are the physician who's made a way, that you have provided for new hearts, for, for heart surgery instead of Band-Aids. And would you keep us anchored in this new identity that we're called to live now as your children and that we would be about your business, that we would go out into our neighborhoods, our workplaces, our schools, our homes, and that we would allow you to form Christ in us, that we would allow you to establish us as a blessing to the people around us, not uh, withholding your goodness, not taking from others, but being a blessing because you've called us to be a blessing. Would you establish us increasingly in the identity that you call us to? And may we be a blessing in this world as we go out to make you visible. In the name of Jesus, amen. Go make the invisible God visible.